eventually I end up with a 40 year sentence and your viewers are probably like 40 years. What's he doing out? I end up doing 17 years, five months, 21 days. Trump changes the law, the first step act because of the first step act. I end up writing this argument for Conrado can too. It was the first person to win a uh, compassionate release motion and thousands and thousands of people have gotten out because of it. You know, we were sitting in a prison cell and I'm like, bro, I think I'm right. And I had told Conrado Cantu, I'm like, hey, man, I think I'm right. If you want to try it, we'll try it. And I tried it. I really practiced on his case. Became a jailhouse lawyer in prison. Not being arrogant. One of the best, bro. And I get people out every day. All right, man. So we're back. We got Chad Marks with us today. Chad's story is a little bit different because he hasn't been in the drug game the way that most of us were. But he has had to rebuild his life from prison. He's had to rebuild his life from zero. And now he is doing very well. So first of all, thank you, bro, because... Everything you've done today has been way above and beyond what you had to do. Well, I definitely appreciate you. It's it's shocking to for a dude to have a trailer with a studio in it like this. Like I like this, bro. Yeah, this and for is you, dope. you know, for you to travel the way you traveled. Give me one second. I got one thing that I can't. You, you didn't hit the record button. No, I got all the record buttons going. But hold tight. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Here, this for you. What the hell is this? I saw you, bro. Okay. Oh, yeah, you're crazy. <laughs> yeah, check it out. Check that hat out. Pull that hat out. Check it out. I want you to look at Okay. Nice Bill's hat. Where the hell did you get check this Check that back out, bro. Oh, yeah. Okay. Blood on the razor wire TV. You when like you go that? interview dudes, do you bring them a bag? Nah, I brought one to Ian. I brought one to you. Okay, man. I definitely appreciate it. And then I got a Spanky Monkey, Monkey shirt, shirt in there. It's a couple stickers, maybe. If you don't have some stickers, I got some I got, in the truck. I got some from you before, but I'll wear that Spanky Monkey on my next live. That's what's up, my man. I got you. I appreciate it. Yeah, that, that uh, hat, man, when they told me they could put your blood and razor wire on, I was like, no question. Do that shit, yeah. bro. I want to personalize <laughs> that shit. I appreciate it. Yeah, because that's me reaching back out and showing you, like, you answer my phone calls. You always return a text, bro. A lot of people don't do that shit. You know yeah. it. 100%. Uh, <clears throat> so, yeah, that little run out to the truck wore me out. Should probably quit smoking, right? Are you recording yet? Yeah, yeah, we're recording right now. You don't want to start over? No, we can go. But, yeah, this is real shit, right? Like, you know what I mean? I don't care about all that. This is us keeping it 100. All right. So tell us your story, man. Give us an introduction. Tell us a little bit about you. You've done this 100 times, so I know you got it right on the top of your head. So my story is probably like in the beginning, you said I wasn't really in the drug game like you guys were, but I was. I actually was. I, I never really used drugs, but I was a drug dealer, man. Right. And grew up, you know, father really wasn't present. My father was a drug addict, shot at me and my mother with a 12-gauge shotgun. We escape. We get away. Eventually, my mom meets another guy. They they connect. My father leaves to Vegas with one of my mom's good friends. He ends up with her. He marries her. He has a daughter with her. So really, I didn't really have a real father figure in my life, right? I had a stepfather who, you know, today I respect and, and all of that, but he was present for a while, and then me and him started beefing. I'm like, you ain't telling me what to do. Mm -hmm. When I realized he wasn't my dad because he came into my life when I was three years old. Mm -hmm. I'm like, this dude ain't my dad. But really, man, he was the only dad that I really ever knew. So as I got older, there was some, you know, conflict between me and him. And he was a tough, he was a tough dude, man. I mean, he, he did put his hands on me when I was a kid and I'm not talking about spanking. I'm talking about punching you, you know, okay. like a man abusive, a little bit. And the people would be like, damn, you respect that dude. Now I do, man. I was a horrible kid at times, man. Mm -hmm. I did a lot of bad shit where I thought that I could swing on him and all of that type of stuff. Well, guess what? You swing on me. I'm swinging back. Right. Mm -hmm. So anyway, eventually he leaves the house and that's kind of when things all go downhill, man. I, I, you know, I'm out there. I got a friend named Booper I talk about in my book, Blood on the Razor Wire, in the book. Booper's uncle, his mom's a prostitute. His uncle's got a house with four or five prostitutes in it. They're selling powder cocaine back then. I'm broke. I'm poor. I'm like, yo. You know, that's when you look up to the drug dealers in your neighborhood. Right. And I'm like, damn, bro, I got to. And in your mind, your young mind, you're thinking these drug dealers are making real money. These dudes ain't making no real money. These, these Now looking back on it. You know, a couple hundred dollars because they got a starter jacket on or a triple fat goose right. and a pair of, I don't even, back then, what was it, the Bo Jacksons? People were rocking right. Reebok pumps. I'm like, damn, man, I wish I had $75 to get a pair of Reebok pumps, and I don't. So I was fascinated by that, and I'm like, yo, bro, I'm trying to sell a couple bags. How much are they paying you off, you know, a bag? And back then, it was like $2 a bag. Mm -hmm. And you start thinking like, damn, bro, I got to sell like a 1,000 bags to make a $1,000. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, I could do that in a week. So long story short, man, I do get into the drug game, you know, um, selling powder cocaine. I remember. At, at what age? You're young when you start this, right? Probably 13 years old, okay. man. So you're Around not 13. even a man yet, right? Yeah, I might have been 12 when I first, right. first started. Let me see. I'll tell you exactly. I was in seventh grade. I had a girlfriend named Julie Calkins. I was, yeah, I was probably uh, 
let's see, probably 12, 12, 13 mm-hmm. years old. And at first we're out there. I, the first thing that I'm selling is we used to sell BC cold medicine. I don't know if people remember that, mm-hmm. but you could cook that shit up. Mm-hmm. People were cooking that up. It would come back and it was like, it was a cold medicine. And then when people would smoke it, they'd be like, oh man, it tastes like medicine. And some people would really tell you that they're getting high. It would numb their mouth, all of that. Some people actually believe that they were getting high and we were selling beat bags. Really, we're selling bullshit. Um, placebo that, effect, they call that, right? I don't know what the hell they call it, yeah, but I know that we were selling effect. it. Placebo effect. You think you're taking something that makes you feel a certain way and just your brain tells you. Yeah, their brain was telling them mm-hmm. that. So, um, you know, I kind of started out that way with, with doing that. Then I got a little bit a little bit further involved with, with a kid that I refer to as my cousin, YB, yellow boy, pretty well-known dude. Started selling bags for them. I remember my parents, my stepfather, and my mother coming to find me, took me out of the house, man. Pulled my pants down and, mm-hmm. and 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 spanked me, bro. Yeah, I know trying, it's like trying to teach you a lesson, but that's yeah. how they did it in our day, bro. They don't yeah. do that nowadays. They did that shit when we was kids. 13, 14 years old. They pulled me out of a house on driving park where we were driving at today, and pulled my pants down, spanked the shit out of me, and then shortly thereafter, that's when my stepfather ended up leaving the house, and that's when I really got involved. Because it was in, easier to run over mom, right? Yeah, yeah. You thought you, I was the boss now. I'm right. I'm the head of the household. I'm the right. man here. And really, man, I was just an ignorant kid, really a street punk at that time. So, you know, that's that's how I started in the drug game. And, you know, you met my brother today at the store. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And eventually we end up catching an assault second over a chick. We don't beat up a chick. We I call and like, hey, man, where's Maria? At? And the dude's like, oh, I'm banging her right now. Well, Maria was my girl. So I'm like, oh, yeah, I'll be right there. So we head out there and, and we get into a little squabble with these dudes. And my brother hits the kid in the head with a piece of steel rebar. Next thing I know, I'm charged with a felony at the age of 16. I end up getting a two to six. He gets a two to six. We go to state prison at 16 years old. Um, spent a couple of years in state prison, make my first parole board, come home. I'm out for a little while. I catch a violation. I do two more years in the state on a violation, come home. And then I think I'm home probably 15 months, and I catch a 40-year bid in federal prison. Okay, so back to the state thing. Where did you do state time? Like, would you start out in a home for boys or – no, I went to a men's prison. My okay. first prison was Gowanda when it had first opened. Um, and it was wild back then, man. You know, now it's like a it, it ended up becoming a DWI prison, then a sex offender prison. Oh, okay. But it was pretty wild. And then one day they packed us up and I go to R and D. I'm like, damn, I'm leaving my brother, man. They pack us up, we go to R and D. We get down to R and D. I get down there and he's down there packing up too. They're shipping all the young dudes out because they're bringing all these DWI offenders in there. They sent us to Wyoming Correctional Facility across the street from Attica. We were there ten days. On Christmas Eve, we end up getting into a physical altercation with some cats. I got stabbed in the face right here. My brother got stabbed like five or six times in the face. Really, my brother ends up fighting this kid. He's whooping him. He drops him. The kid's embarrassed. He tells him that we jumped him. We didn't jump him. My brother whooped him one-on-one. And uh, they turned it into kind of like a racial thing. And they stabbed us. We're in there. We, we were working. They sent me across the street to um, Attica. They end up sending him to Kasaki, two of the worst prisons in New York State. We're six. We're probably 17 at this time now. and. Uh, I'm in Attica, like, wow, I'm in Attica. Attica right. State Prison. Right. Right. Infamous for the riots. And, names next to. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I'm 17 years old in Attica, and he's 17 years old in Kasaki. And Kasaki was all young dudes, you know. Wild and out. Yeah, stabbing. Cut, over there, a lot, of, a lot of cutting in the face, you okay. know, stuff like that. And eventually, I end up making my first parole board, like I said. I, come, I, I end up leaving Attica and going to Comstock. And I come home from Comstock, come home. Catch a violation after I'm out for, I don't know, maybe seven, eight months. Go back for another two years. Get out, and then, you know, I'm back on the street. I'm hustling. Right. And so when you first come home from state, though, you try to do right. Try to get a job. I did try to do right. I ended up getting a little bullshit job putting pallets together on a midnight shift. And, dude, for real, back then, I want to say they were paying you like six fifty an hour, and you're working the midnight shift. Mm-hmm. And then the supervisor said something to me. Because I wasn't doing something right. And I'm like, man, honestly, I was like, man, F this job and F right. you. How about that? I'm out of here. Back to the streets. Well, it wasn't back to the streets yet. I ended up getting another job at this punch press company, right? And my mom's like, oh, I'm so glad you're doing good. You got a job. And then they ended up firing me, man. Um, I got fired because someone else broke apart. And they like, I was the young dude. They like blamed it. They broke the punch press. And they're like, no, it wasn't me. It was him. And it really wasn't me. So they fired me. And I just took my check and said, you know what? I think I went and bought an eight ball, a, a crack, or, or mm-hmm. a quarter ounce of crack. And then it was on to the races after that. You know, eight ball turns into a quarter, quarter turns into a half, half turns into an ounce, an ounce turns into what we called back then a 62, 62 into a big eight. And then it was on, man. It was on a pop. And I showed you my mother's 
porch that I was, you know, I sold dope there the whole summer. When I say dope, I mean crack. Well, I sit so, right on the porch. People just pull up. You serve them up. And you see my brother and all that. They're 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 making money, but they're spending their money. Not me. I was putting my money in my pocket. Okay. And I'm saving it. And I'm saving it. And now I'm not buying, you know, quarter ounce of crack no more. Now I'm buying. Well, I got up to a 62 and from a 62 to a big eight. And then it just, it escalated. And then I took all of these dudes and, you know, not, I, I don't glamorize this shit in any way, shape or form, but they all became like, I was the boss now. I saved my money and now I got the connect. Right, well, they're getting paid from what you're doing, right? You're, you're telling them what to do. They're getting money. That's they're it. They're going to listen. And, and that's, that's, that's where it started, man. And eventually I end up with a 40 year sentence and your viewers are probably like 40 years. What's he doing now? I end right. up doing. 17 years, five months, 21 days, Trump changes the law, the First Step Act. Because of the First Step Act, I end up writing this argument for Conrado Cantu. It was the first person to win a uh, compassionate release motion, and thousands and thousands of people have gotten out because of it. Of course, the lawyers, everybody would have figured it out eventually, but I figured it out with my boy, and I got to give him props, Christopher Hunter. Mm -hmm. You know, we were sitting in a prison cell, and I'm like, bro, I think I'm right. And I had told Conrado Cantu, I'm like, hey, man, I think I'm right. If you want to try it, we'll try it. And I tried it. I really practiced on his case. Became a jailhouse lawyer in prison. Okay. Not being arrogant. One of the best, bro. Right. Um, And I get people out every day. I mean, day. you don't have to be arrogant. It's proven by what you've done since you came home. Well. Like, it's proven by the motherfuckers you brought home, right? Like 100%. I there's get people no arrogance out. and proof, proofs in the pudding, right? I got a dude right now that I'm about to, I already won part of it before I got him a reduction. Tommy Reynolds. Mafia guy. They say he killed, you know, a bunch of people. Um, and I, I'm on the verge. He'll, I, I think he'll be out in the next within 60 days. Okay. And that'll be a big thing when he gets out. So what's something like that cost somebody? If somebody's viewing right now, they got somebody that's sitting in jail. There might be something that they can do. They reach out to you. It depends on the case, man. It depends on how much work's involved. I do help some people for free. I help a lot of people for free. Okay. I got people that call me because I know what it's like to be in there and call a lawyer and they say, Hey man, I got real issues. And they're like, Hey man, 25,000 dude, I've been in jail 10 years. Mm -hmm. I don't have $25 right mm -hmm. now. So I know what the struggle's like. So I do help people. I help a lot of people for free. I help a lot of women for free. Believe it or not, a lot of women don't have no money. They don't have no one to help them. They got kids. They're like, hey, I got to get out of here. And if you've got a legitimate issue, then I'll help you if you're broke. Right. But I do charge it. I got a family to take care right, of. I absolutely. got bills to pay. I do charge. And I make good money. Mm -hmm. But you know what? I, I, I get results, so man. So a couple of examples real quickly. Like what's one? Tell me three that stand out in your head most importantly. One, one that was important to me was a kid named Chazzy Glenn. I believe that was the... It was probably the second or third life sentence that I won. Chazzy was involved in, you know, the G Shine Bloods, how the, you know, they started in New York City. Um, there's two murders in the case. He has a life sentence. He calls me. I do that case and I win it, man. It's it was a big, big case. So he ended up doing what? I well, I got his life sentence reduced to thirty five years. Okay. And now we're doing something else, which we've been trying to get a little bit lower. But, you know, a year ago he had no out date. Now mm -hmm. he has an out date. He's got like mm -hmm. four or five years left no matter what. Um, that was a big case for me, Noah Spino. This dude, like, turned his life around. He's a Christian. He uh, he had life, man. He had a murder. I won that case, got his life sentence reduced to 30. And this is the biggest case for me is this kid named Laval Farmer, right? Grew up real. This is a case that really affected me. It, it affected me mentally and emotionally. This dude grew up with just in New York City, horrible. Mom's feeding him rice with ketchup every night for dinner. They misbehave. The mother's making them stand on the fire escape. You know, that's cold steel in, in, mm -hmm. in the middle of November with no clothes on, no socks, no shoes. And then one day when he was like seven or eight years old, his mother takes him to the courthouse with his brothers and his sisters. And then he never seen his mother again. She left him at the courthouse and they ended up she getting adopted. So long story short, Laval Farmer probably has done more than any other prisoner I've ever seen in prison as far as rehabilitation. Dude turned his life around 100%. Deserves to get out of prison. Some people might not agree because... He was, a, he was a gang member out in the street, 19 years old, 20 years old, ends up with a life sentence. He kills a 14-year-old or 15-year-old kid, right? Thought that he was part of a rival gang, and he really wasn't. So this kid didn't deserve to die, and I do believe that this that Laval Farmer gets deserves a second chance. I did his case. It's been pending. It's in front of the judge. He's got a tough judge in New York, and I'm hopeful that he gets a second chance because he deserves to get out of prison more than I did, bro, to be honest with you. Okay. And I know... You know, there's a victim here. He was a kid. Family's heartbroken. You could never bring that kid back. But I just, I don't know, man. I just, I think he deserves a second right. chance. Well, you bro. know what it's like to sit in there, bro. You know what it's like to make those mistakes based on ignorance instead of wisdom. You know, in the beginning of his motion, Jamie, I wrote, I wrote something, I believe, in the front of it. And I said, does Laval Farmer deserve to die in prison? 
Mm-hmm. And then I go into the history and I say, where was he going in life? Mm-hmm. Mother was a drug addict. Stepfather was sexually, you know, sexually abusing the kids. And mm-hmm. it was just, a whole, you're feeding your kids rice. And, and they stole like a hot dog off. The, his sister stole the hot dog one time off the stove. The hot dogs weren't for the kids. It was for the adults. The kids had to eat the rice. And she ate the hot dog. And I think the mother beat her with a coat hanger. This was a death penalty case in the beginning. So all this stuff is documented, the family stuff. I put all that stuff in there, and I just hope the dude gets a second chance. It's like he was a – it was from the trauma of his life that made him go in a certain direction, right? Like 100%. When your mother – when there's no food, your mother's selling the food stamps. There's men in and out of the house. And I've seen this stuff growing up, not in my household, but in my neighborhood. Even though we were poor and we were fucked up, my mother wasn't a drug addict. My mother – there was a point when she started drinking a little bit. We didn't, I didn't really have a dad. Like I said, I had a stepfather. He, you know, he did his best, but it, that only lasted what, eight or nine years before right. he was gone. It's not a whole lot of time, you know, growing up that you got a stepdad for eight years that you, there's some conflict, but I seen this stuff, man. You go in these houses, there's no furniture. I contributed to that shit, man. I was a crack dealer, right. man. You go in these houses, man, and there's no furniture and, and, and the, the mom's in the bathroom hitting, you know, hitting dope dealers off for $20 bags. And you see it, man, they're heating the house with the stove. All they got is gas. There ain't no there ain't no heat coming out. Where are you going in life when you're living like that? Eating rice, eating cereal with milk. Like, it's just shocking, man. It is, man. A lot of people seem to be living that way around here too, man. Like a little tour through your city was crazy. You know what I mean? It's, <laughs> it's definitely definitely wild shit going on in the streets on a regular. It's cold as hell. It's like it's cold up here. It's living out there has got to be. You seen you seen the kid Jamie come up to the car? I did. I was around him when he was you know, he was kind of like the holster for a dude, but right. Were- so just a little context, we pull up to a stoplight and you knew this dude was going to be there, right? Yeah. You knew he's going to be standing there bumming. Yeah. And you had a $20 bill in your hand ready for him before he was fucking seen the car. It changed his day, didn't it? Yeah. It changed absolutely. his night. He almost cried. He was ready like, to cry. He almost cried right there in a the minute. Like, thank you so much. Cause he just wandered over and went and did his thing from there. Right. You know, I'm going to tell you this. I have a dude that I talked about in my book. I come home from prison. And I'm driving, and, and it was like minus 30 degrees like two years ago here, right? Snowing, blizzard, minus 30 degrees out. And I see this kid. This is the kid that I used to sell drugs with, one of the first people I sold drugs with, a kid named Booper. And I see him, man, no coat, and I, and I pull over. I'm like, yo, what's up? He's like, oh, what's up, man? And I'm like, yo, where, where are you going? He's like, I'm going over here to the church, man. I ain't got nowhere to go, man. And I'm like, damn, bro. I, I'm, you know, I got out of prison. I'm, I'm driving in a Ben's truck at the time, which is my wife's truck. And I'm like, damn, bro, you're out here without a coat. And I just, I only been out of prison a year and I'm driving around in a Ben's truck. Right. I pick him up. I take him to, over to the church. His mother died. His grandmother died. That's the dude I was telling you about, like Bobby Burns and them. They had their house. He was a pimp. His mom was a prostitute. And I'm like, damn, bro, your mother died. Your grandmother died. You got nowhere to go. But you're 41 years old, man. Like, you got to figure this mm-hmm. out. You, you used to always, you never had to pay rent. You never had to do any of that stuff. You could always go to your grandmother's house and it was always warm there. You could always go to your mother's house, even though she was a prostitute, whatever. She had a place for you to go to. And now all you got is you. You're going to a church, bro. It hurt me inside. I'm like, bro, what size, you know, coat do you wear? I'm going to go buy you a Carhartt coat right now. He's like, nah, man, I'm good, man. But eventually I did help him out, got him, you know, some stable, you know, living situation. Mm -hmm. Tried to help him out, help him get a car. He messed that up. He messed a whole bunch of stuff up. But I have continuously helped this dude and. I had a conversation with him two months ago, and I said, look, man, and I explained that. Bro, I got out of jail with a plan, man. You guys, you, I grew up with you. You've been out here 20 years while I was in prison, mm-hmm. and you ain't got shit. Mm-hmm. You got to look in the mirror, man. You got to want better because there ain't no one here to give you no more. It's on you. Whether you swim or drown is on you. You're in the driver's seat. And I was like, dude, I can't believe that you're in even where he's living now. I'm like, bro, I can't believe that you're living in a house. You're going to bed 1, 2 in the morning watching movies. You're waking up at 11, 12 o'clock in the afternoon. You got to get a job. I could never live like that. I can, I can dude, if I had to work at McDonald's, I can't be with no money in my pocket, no food to eat. It can't be me. One of bro. my really tight homies, bro, that I met in 99 in jail, has does the same thing. He's 45 years old, lives off mom and dad, uh, has overdosed two or three times in the last year. This is my partner. I yeah. love this dude like a brother. I root for him every day, but he's stuck in that same cycle. I tell him the same shit. They have to want it, don't they? You got to want you it. You got to want it. It would have been easy for me to get out here and have nothing, right? Right. I, uh, you know, I had an excuse. Especially when you're pretty much used to having almost nothing inside. I mean, you can only have so much stuff inside, right? How well did you do in prison? Did you 
<clears throat> hustle, grind, make money, work every day. So my prison experience was much different, man, than just being out here and, you know, I mean, it, it was different than other people. Like I had a 40 year sentence, bro. I was right. sentenced to 40 years at the age of 24. Right. That changes your mindset, right? You're going in with 40 days or you're going in with 40 years. Your whole brain is different. I tried to find. So when I was on the street, I had a couple of dollars, bro. I was hustling. Mm -hmm. I always had nice clothes. I liked to dress nice. So that carried over even in prison. Like if you came to the prison, you had Nike sunglasses. They, they were selling as a Christmas item, like in California, Oakley's and shit. People would come in. I'd buy them, bro. I, I, I need those. Absolutely. You know, white G shock wash yes. and brand new sneakers. It was the only thing in prison at one point in time in my life that gave me any kind of enjoyment. It made me feel like maybe I am close to the street. Maybe I will get out of here someday. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, man, I had 40 years, bro. And it used to hurt. It hurt at night. You know what I mean? When you lay down at night and you start thinking like, damn, I'm going to get out of here when I'm 60. Mm -hmm. My mother will be gone. My sister might be gone. Where am I going at 60? Am I going to sleep on the street? And I used to think, well, damn, maybe someone will hire me as a paralegal at a law office when I get out when I'm 60. Or maybe I could sell hot dogs and hamburgers from a hot dog car. These are all the th I, What can I do at 60? But you're I can't happier to sell hot dogs than you are to sit in there. 100%, bro. You know, 100%. I always said you could hang me from the Eiffel Tower by my toe with a paintbrush, and I'll paint that bitch all day before I'll sit in this prison. Hey, uh, <laughs> I did 17 years, five months, and 21 days straight without going home, bro. And it was... It hurt, man. It hurts, bro. No matter what. It does. You know, and, and we've been in some of the same prisons. We've been around some of the same dudes. I've seen dudes, man, that fucked their whole lives off. AJ, one of them, yes. man. AJ. A picture of him right over there. You got a picture of AJ? No. I'm going to look at it when we. No, there's not a picture there. I'm lying. Oh. But he was wrapped up in those pictures because that's the prison yeah. where I was with him at. I mean, dude fucked his whole life off, right. man. And he was a cool cat, man. I liked AJ. He, he was just a laid back dude. I would have never thought that of him. He didn't even seem like a violent person. Some of them dudes just never want to get out. Yeah, I got friends from my hometown that just keep going back. But it's more like drugs send them back on violation after violation after violation. Yeah. So did you ever think about just like, fuck all this, I'm just going to hang it up and end my life? Was that ever something to come <laughs> into your head? Let me tell you this. Anybody that's done a lot of time, dudes probably won't ever admit this, but there were times, man, when, of course, I felt like, what am I going to do, man? I'm going to get out when I'm, like I said, I'm going to get out when I'm 60. Should I stay here and just be miserable and suffer? Mm -hmm. for 40 years and then get out and have nothing. But I never had the balls to do it. And bro, I'll tell you something that's crazy is I think I might've mentioned this before is my grandmother took her own life. My father died getting high. My brother shot himself in the head with a shotgun. Um, I've been through, I mean, I've been through some stuff, man, in my family. So I, I don't know, man. I, I got, I'm a, my mother's side ain't like that. I got my mom's side in me. You okay. know what I mean? So, Right, and at the same time, too, you probably thought about how it would destroy your family the way it did you from experiencing it. Well, you know what? I love my mom, bro. Yeah, and I'm with that. It would devastate my mother if anything like that. And I know there were times she worried about that, but I didn't have the balls to do it, bro. Some people say people that take their lives are cowards, but you got to have balls to do Absolutely. that, bro. Absolutely. So gotta... let's talk about mom. So when you went in, obviously everything that she was doing up to the point of 40 years in prison, your mom was not happy, right? She was not proud of you. Um. No, of course not. But, you know, I was out here. My mother knew what I was doing. She knew I was, you know, hustling, getting money. And she'd tell me all the time, you're going to end up dead or in prison for the mm -hmm. rest of your life. And, and she was still there for you. Yeah, my mother loves me, me man. Me too. And I took care of my mom, man. And, you know, there were plenty of times my mother would show up on a visit. I, she says it now. She used to tell me for years, I'm getting out of here, mom. Don't worry. I'm going to get out of here. I'm getting out of here. She, this year's my year. She believe you? Hey, if you don't believe it, no one else will, right? right? She had to believe me, man. And she, you know, after a while, she just kind of got to the point where she was like, just hoping. But right. And my stepfather, who right, is but, my but hold on, hold on. When you yeah. come home and touched your mom for the first time, bro, you're a free man. You come yeah. home and hug your mom. Tell me about that. Like that's got to be amazing. Yeah, it, I mean, I remember drive where we drove. I, I drove home, right? And my mom didn't come get me. Um, I ended up driving home with, with this lady that was helping me out. She worked at the federal defender's office. And I remember going to my mother's house, man. And she was just crying, bro. Plenty right. of times she cried on the phone. Right. And I was like, I told you I'm going to get out. See, that's real out. shit, man. That's real shit. I believe in manifesting things, bro. You right. got to believe it. Make you gotta, it happen. You gotta, yeah, you got to make it happen. Don't stop until it does. And you're proof of that, bro. So you get out of prison, you got nothing. Where do you start? Like, I just got out of prison. Where, what do I do? What do you tell me to do before I leave to prepare? 
you know, you have to have you have to have a plan, bro. You can't walk out here without a plan. You know, there's a lot of dudes that walk out here without a plan. They end up, hey, where am I going? I just got out of jail. I, I got to go to the mission. Don't even I, have an ID. Don't have nothing, man. Mm -hmm. You got to be prepared. I came out, you know, I shouldn't say that I came out with nothing because I had a couple dollars. You know, I did legal work in prison. I saved a couple bucks. I mean, I didn't have no $10,000, right. twenty. I, I mean, I had a couple dollars. But you weren't flat broke. I was not flat broke. I, I'll, I'll keep it real. Which I came home with, I think, $8,000, right. right? So you didn't have to wear them cardboard pants and that polo they give you. To no, do. I had family members that sent I me did. clothes. I had to wear that shit out, bro, right into Cracker Barrel. My people brought me stuff like yeah. eight hours from where we was, but I had to wear that shit out of the prison. You know, like preparing. There's dudes in there that, you know, that just sit around and watch the movie TV for mm -hmm. 10 years, and then they mm -hmm. get out of jail, and they're like, oh, this is the world? You're preparing to fail, man. I came out with a plan. I knew I was going to start a paralegal business. Um, I knew nothing about YouTube. Someone had told me something like, hey, man, dudes are making six figures doing these videos. I'm like, oh, I'd like, and I was fascinated, right? And of course, I seen a little bit of it on, a, I think it was Larry Lawton. I seen a little bit of it on um, cell phones in there. I'm like, oh, shit, this shit looks right. But it, once I got out, I didn't, I didn't think about doing that. I didn't know the first thing about an iPhone. I didn't know right. anything. So I knew right, I was. So you went in. There's freaking wall, uh, you know, phones hanging on the wall, right? Like yeah. cordless phones. They had cordless phones yeah. at that point, right? I mean, we had cell phones when I went to jail, okay. but nothing like nothing this. Nothing like this. There was a flip phone when I went to jail. Okay. I went February 2003. I go to prison. That's when I went in. I went in uh, March 03. I mean, I, I had a chick that had an Obama. No, not an. Was it? Yeah, was it an Obama phone? No, it wasn't Obama. Remember, they were giving out free phones. Mm -hmm. Like welfare was yeah, giving yeah, out free absolutely. phones. I had a chick that had one of them like free phones. You could play like the Tetris game mm -hmm. on it or something. You know, phones you had to text like the three digits to hit the letter. Yeah, the phone wasn't wasn't nothing back mm -hmm. then. So you know, when I did get out, like I was saying, I came out. I did come out with a plan. I knew I was starting a paralegal business. Did not know that it was going to flourish like it was, like it did. I had my book. My book I thought was going to be my stepping stone, and this is how I'm going to get a foundation, a little bit of money together okay. with, with the book. So I ended up, you know, I had the book, put the book together. It did really well, man. It like sold out on Amazon. So go get it. Blood on the razor wire. And you wrote that in prison. I wrote it in and prison. And it's about your trip to prison. Yeah. And honestly, dude, I don't want to be like, oh, this dude's an arrogant mom. Dude, it's one of the best prison books you, you'll ever read. Right. And the person that told me that it, to him it was better than his book, he said this. Pete Early. I interviewed Pete Early. He wrote The Hot House. Mm -hmm. The Hot House is the best prison book I've ever read in my life. And I've read plenty of prison books, right? And I put that book together, and Pete Early, man, he wrote an article about it for me, and he's like, "Dude, your book is nice. is awesome. It's excellent." And I, it ended up selling and out. You the first give day. out audio copies of that, right? When All you the do time, lives and stuff on your channel. All the time, absolutely. Yep. That's what's up. I narrate my own book. Right. So you had a plan. You come out. You know what you're gonna do, and then like you start helping people along the way too, right? Because you know what it's like to be there. One hundred percent. I get out of prison, dude, and I, I literally like the chick that worked at the Federal Defender's Office that was helping me. She was running my Facebook page. There were people that were contacting her like, yo, we would like to hire Chad as soon as he gets out to help us. So, like, as soon as I get out, dude, like, these people hire me, man. I make, like, five grand, like, the first week I'm out, right? Mm -hmm. I'm like, damn, I I thought I'd get out and run a paralegal business. Maybe I'll make 2500 bucks a month. I can do it at night. You know, it, it'll be all right. And then the parole officer was like, you got to get a job. And I'm like, I am the job. I'm the product. I'm about to show you. Mm -hmm. You got 30 days to get a job. I don't care if it's McDonald's. But... No, I'm running a paralegal business, buddy. And I did it, man. And I made a lot of money that first month and showed them, hey, this is what I'm doing. And this is what I like doing. And I worked with a bunch of different organizations when I first got out. Like they had me doing legal work for them. Um, Amy Pova, the Can Do Clemency organization. Weldon Angelos, he ended up getting a pardon from Trump. I did a bunch of legal work for him and with him. So, you know, people like, they put me out there a little bit, but right. people knew who I was. I wrote the first compassionate release motion in the country right, to win. I mean, that's got to give your name some kind of legitimacy, 100%. doesn't it? And, and I wrote for prisoner. You ever read Prisoner's Legal News when you were in there? Mm -hmm. So it's like a prison magazine, criminal legal news. I was a staff writer, dude. I I wrote all about legal cases. And, okay. and, and, and I, I mean, people knew who I was. I wrote really good articles. So people are like, hey, man, Chad got out. And I told them dudes when I left, man, I'm going to be the voice of the voiceless. I'm going to come out here and help people. And I did, bro. I came out here and I helped people. Up. And you still have contact with a lot of people in prison today, huh? 100%. I'm going to pick my boy up in April, man. He was my he was my celly for five years, man. Got a 20-year sentence for being a middleman on a couple kilos of cocaine, and they gave him 20 years, man. Uh, and he, he's had to finish that whole 20-year bid? 17 years, bro. Oh, 17 shit. years. Yeah. And he made 200 bucks. It's fucking crazy. It's man. outrageous, man. It's fucking outrageous. crazy. But, yeah, man, being, being the one that goes and picks him up, I'm sure you're going to bless him. 
I just sent him a package. I bought him some Air Maxes, Nike sweatsuit, Nike shirt, socks. But yeah, I'm gonna take care of him. It's my boy, man. No question. Yeah, I just lost my homie, man, to fentanyl. He just overdosed and died in his mama's house, man. Dude, I robbed a pharmacy with, and that's just, yeah, that's that's some fucked up shit to see people have to go through some of that. And his mom's like 82, bro, a broker. You know what I mean? 45 yeah. years with a with a strung out son. Like no mama wants to go through that, right? No, not at all. Uh, yeah, we got told on, man. We got snitched on for robbing, and these other people just kind of did six months when they were supposed to do 80 years, and we did six years. Yeah. So another thing I want to talk about is i seen a video you did where the dude that ratted on you, you did an interview with him. Let's talk about that a little bit. How did <laughs> that? Because that's big shit, dog. And the reason I asked that is because one of my <clears throat> best homies from growing up 16 to 26 when I went to prison, my right-hand man, that's who told on me. And I don't want to see him. I don't yeah. want to go near him. So to see you sitting there talking to this dude that fucking gave you 40 years, that's that's that shows the arrogance that you're talking about that is an arrogance because it's growth. Yeah, let me say this, right? This dude was, first, I, I want to say this. He didn't give me 40 years. I gave myself 40 years, right? Okay, see, again, back to the accountability, man. That's what I it, did. It, no, so, you know, when, when you're able to see it in that perspective and, and stop blaming everybody else, mm -hmm. Then you see things a little bit differently. Okay. Um, you know, you know, I'm with my wife, the girl that I was married to when I went to prison. Mm -hmm. Um, she didn't wait for me. She had to go on with her life. I had a 40 year sentence. We reconnect. And I end up seeing this dude when I'm with her. Um, and I see him at a gas station. And my first reaction is like, man, F you, bro. You know, like right. and I say that to him. And I'm like, hey, all you do, you just do right here. He's no good. You're selling him. He's a you know, he's I, I did, bro. I went in on him, bro. You're a crackhead and okay. you're a piece of shit. But let me tell you how it happens. This was a kid that I looked up to in my neighborhood. He played the drums. He had a rock band. He always had nice bikes. He was the kid that used to steal bikes and sell them from the kids in the suburbs. And, you know, we looked up to this kid in our neighborhood, you know, and we thought he was a cool dude, right? Um, and I see him one day. He's walking down the street. I know he's drug addicted. And I pull over, man, to help him. Like, yo, and I've always been a helper, man. And after this shit happened, I always vowed to never help people again. But that didn't work out. Um so I take him and, and, and I take him off the street. He's like, hey, bro, buy me something to eat. And I remember this like it was yesterday, bro. I said, you see them you see them cars going by? I said, how old are you, bro? I think he was like 30 at the time. And I'm 20, what, 22, 23. I said, that's your life passing by you, bro. You used to be that dude, man. Your life's passing by you. Long story short, I take him to this house that he's staying at because his parents are coming to get him to take him to rehab in the morning, his mom. Put his mom through a bunch of shit, stole her TV, stealing shit out of the house. I end up putting him in the ho I end up taking him over there. They put him in, in rehab the next day. He calls me. I tell him, hey, bro, when you get out of rehab, call me. I had a roofing company back then. I tell him, call me. I'll give you a job. Because he's like, hey, you give me a job when I get out? I'm like, yeah, yeah. I never expect him to really call me. He does call me. Give him a job. He, you know, he's like, hey, Chad, the people, his dad ended up dying. I was, I liked his dad a lot. He's like, I'm staying with my dad's friends. They're getting high, bro. This ain't working out, but I need to get out of there. And, dude, I do the craziest shit ever, man, which I can't. This is my young 20. 23 year old man with my wife i tell my wife hey this kid he's italian dude he's all right i'm gonna let him stay in the basement for 30 days till he can you know get his shit together he's not getting high at the time hopefully he'll get his shit together i'll give him a job at the construction company. He's you know he's a laborer he's doing tear offs and all of that it benefited me a little bit too mm -hmm. you know what i mean but i took him in out of the kindness of my heart and he robs me man and once he robs me he goes to the cops and says hey i can get chad for you guys if you give me the money to pay him back i can get him he wears a wire on me, and that's how my case gets started, man. Um, he testified at my trial. You know, I get 40 years at the age of 24. It gets reduced because of the First Step Act. I get out. I see him. I'm probably out eight, nine months. I see him. My first interaction is, yo, bro, you're a piece of shit, man. I was angry, but I was hurt, man. When I seen him, I was. it was like, I don't know how to explain. Like, you felt like you were there again, right, you know? Right. Like, it took me back to the dude that I used to be. I wasn't a nice dude, bro. Plain and simple. I mean, I help people out in the community. Yeah, that's great. The judge talked about, yeah, you bought kids pizza and you gave people clothes and then you were, you know, beating up on people that are drug addicts and, you know, doing things that are, you know, violent stuff. The judge told me, he said, you're a street punk when he sentenced me. He used them words. So it took me back to, to that place in that moment. And I was with Jen. I said, remember Jen? Remember you, you, you destroyed my life, bro. And I was still blaming him. Right. Then a year later, I see him standing in front of, uh, a house that I know that's that's a crack house, right? A heroin house, crack, whatever. His, his trucks broke down. I pulled over. I'm like, what's up, man? He's way, He weighs me down. Like the weirdest shit ever. I don't know if he knew it was me. And he's like, 
oh shit, bro. A little bit surprised when yeah. you see your face. He's like, I need a jump, man. Can you give me a jump? I'm like, dude, I'm not using my Audi to give you a jump. You know, like I'm not. And we ended up talking. I'm like, bro, I ain't mad at you, man. Like in that moment, dude, I felt like, I don't know, dude. I felt like weight was lifted off my. I wasn't mad at him no more, bro. I turned my life around. I got, I'm a father. I'm a husband, and I had to forgive that dude, man. And I had to forgive him because he did what he did, because he was a drug addict, man. He robbed me because he was a drug addict. He robbed a couple ounces of crack, some money. He robbed me because he wanted to get high, bro. I'm the reason why he's getting high, right? I'm the I'm the drug dealer. I'm the dude selling crack. And I'm mad at him because he robbed me. You can expect a bear to attack you in, in, in the wild, right? right? You should expect a drug addict that's using crack cocaine on a daily basis that robs his own mother will rob you. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like that snake. You know, the lady picked up the snake. The snake was yeah, yeah, yeah. ran over by the lawnmower and she mends the snake back to health. And, and then she's out there playing with the snake, getting ready to release him. The snake bites her. She said, why'd you do that? I'm going to die now. And the snake said, you always knew I was a snake. Yeah. And I don't want to say the dude was a snake. I want to say that he was a drug addict and he wasn't thinking, you know, in his right mind, man. Right. Uh, I've started to, th- I got a little theory that I expect people to be who they are. If yeah. you're always late, I'm expect you to be late. If you're always lying and you never show up for the thing, I'm going to expect that of you. Right. Yeah. Past behavior dictates future behavior. 100%. You've been doing them programs in there, huh? Yeah, well, I definitely did RDAP, man. Yeah. RDAP definitely did a lot for me. Uh, yeah. I didn't get the time off or anything, but they had the weight pile button when I went there, so yeah. I wanted to be on the weights. And I took it seriously. I was a mentor my last nine months. Yeah, uh, They paid me like 50 bucks a month. I was like, I'm here with weights. I'm learning how to stay out of prison. I loved it. Like, It was the spot for me. It's so much better than a penitentiary other yeah. than the the scumbags that walked the yards that you had to put up with that we weren't used to on penitentiary yards. You know what I mean? That's the little difference in it, but... You know, now I just feel like there are scumbags everywhere, bro. They are, and they're left and right, man. It's like every time you turn, there's somebody that's just doing shitty stuff to people left and right. That's the one thing that I despise about prison. You know, we always hear dudes like, convict code, don't be in people's business. Don't. These dudes are in everyone's business, even mm-hmm. in the penitentiary. Mm-hmm. Gang members, independents, you're in everyone else's business, and that's what creates the conflict, which turns into the violence, right? Mm-hmm. And I despise people, man, that prey on people in prison, bro. Just, just despise it. You say you're this dude, but really you're not. You're the dude that's really taking advantage of your own people, the people that you say you stand for. Mm-hmm. It's not It's not like a prison movie. It's This shit's just, people don't even understand it anymore. Right, that loyalty among thieves shit just went out the window. <laughs> yeah. Well, there is no loyalty among thieves, right? If you're right. a thief, you're a thief. Pretty that's much, it. you're going to steal from anybody. If you're a violent dude and, and you're just a troublemaker, you're, that's just who you yeah. are, man. Absolutely. And it's we're already we're already in here fucked up and we're miserable, man. Why are we attacking each other, man? Right, making it worse. Yeah, why aren't we why aren't we pushing for, you know, a better environment, dude, and, and right, food and get the microwaves back and right push for that. I bro. was a big advocate for shit like that. Like the basketball nets would be fucked up or something. I'm putting in requests. Get us a new basketball net. We need this yeah, taken care of. We 100%. need that taken care of. I always did that. Mm-hmm. Hell, I remember going into jail when I had 30 days and there was like 15 things I had taken care of and everybody's like, "Folks, you putting in these requests?" I was like, "Yeah, why are y'all not?" Yeah. Y'all, you've been here two and a half years with this. I was here three days and started putting requests in and had y'all shit fixed. And I'm leaving. Y'all still got to stay here. It's a crazy life in there, man. It is. So look, here's a little part that I want to put in here. It's a little set of questions, about 14 questions. You have the mm-hmm. option to pass on any question. Does that okay. make sense? Uh-huh. Simple enough, good. right? All right. So some of these might not be relevant, but bear with me. Uh... Let's see. What was the most embarrassing thing that happened to you while you was locked up? The most embarrassing thing. This was in state prison, bro. Um, It was hot out. I was playing basketball. wasn't feeling good. And they line you up. This is in Comstock. You got to line up, you know, when the yard's closed, you got to get wh- whatever tier you're on, whatever company you're on, you line up with them. And I'm like, please, man, call us first because I got a shit, bro. Like, sick. My, I'm not feeling well all of a sudden, right? And I'm walking back to the cell. I'm like, you know, you're, you know, you're squeezing your ass cheeks. Like, don't embarrass me. Yes, Dude, I get right to my cell and and their jail bars in Comstock. Uh And they hit the, right when they do that, I shit my pants, bro. I'll never, I never told anyone that, dude. No way. I go in my cell and I'm like, oh my God, it was horrible. And nobody knew but you. Yeah. It wasn't embarrassed other people. I was embarrassed to myself. I was 18, 19 year old kid, man. And I shit my pants. Well, I, but I think it's probably the only time I ever really shit my pants. Yeah, other than when you had diapers on as a baby, right? Yeah. <laughs> it had appreci- been a while. <laughs> I appreciate you sharing that, bro. That's real shit right there. I don't know if I could have shared that with myself. Nah. 
Okay, so uh, what scared you the most while you were locked up? What scared me the most? We're in USP Lee, and there's a kid from Ohio, and we kind of we got an independent car over there, and we're really strong. And there's a situation over there where a dude robs his – this kid's getting money, right? Dude's, black dude steals some dope from him. And he comes out to the out to the fence. You know, you know, you were there, so you mm-hmm. know how the fences mm-hmm. are. We're on the yard getting ready to go back at 3.30. He's like, yo, bro, I'm about to smash this black dude. I'm letting you guys know. And I'm like, bro, just wait a second. Let's talk to his people, see if we can get your shit back and take care of it. He gives me his word that he's going to wait and that we'll take care of it when we come out. I had a little influence there. So I'm like, yo, just relax, bro. We're, we're gonna, we'll, we'll get it worked out, man. We'll get your shit back, get your money back. We'll, we'll figure it out. He's like, all right, bro. He goes in. They hit the deuces. I already knew. He smashes the dude. Now every black dude's on the yard. We got to go outside. We go out there on the yard, and we politic it out, man. But the cops, are they open up the tower. They rack the gun, and it was serious, bro. You could hear a pin drop out there, bro. And I remember my feet, like, scrunching my toes inside my shoes, like, and looking like, damn, bro, it's going to be hard to get over to, you know, of course we got knives out there, but there's, there's 250 black dudes out there and, and 70 white dudes. Mm-hmm. It's not, it's not looking good. Yeah, four Just keeping it real. Seven. It's not looking good, bro. So that was, that was a pretty bad little situation we were in there. Yeah. That was, that was a pretty scary situation. But everybody ended up talking it out instead of fighting it out. Yeah. It ended up getting worked out. Thank God, man. Nice. Nice. Uh, this one I really like. What's the most important thing you would say you learned in prison? <laughs> most important thing I learned in prison was my worth, man. I'm worth more than standing on the corner selling dope, man. I'm worth more than standing out there to make $2,000 for what? A bunch of dime bags? I'm worth more than, you know, standing out there with a gun and taking a chance to, you know, spend the rest of my life in prison. So For getting shot. I learned my worth, man. And I think dudes in prison, you know, I used to teach class and I asked people, what are you worth? We had a lot of young dudes when I was in Raybrook and I was teaching, you know, courses over there, alternative violence project seminar, stuff like that. Leaders breed leaders. And I would ask, what are you worth, man? You'd be crazy. What the, you'd be shocked at what these dudes would say. Hmm. I'm worth a million dollars, man. And then I would give them that scenario I just gave you and tell them, man, I'm priceless, man. There ain't nothing, you know, like the 60 days in, then people go on there and they make 40, 50 grand, two months, they're away from their family. Whatever. Dude, you couldn't pay me a million dollars to go on 60 days in. You couldn't. I, I love asked, my family, bro. I was asked that question on a Facebook Live last night. We was going to do a live tonight and answer yeah. about that. Yeah. About going on six days in. So it's right. a no for you. It's a no for me. Absolute no, he said. I got, two, I got two little boys uh, up there, man. They're twin boys. They're 27 months old. I don't want to miss a, I don't want to miss a minute with them. Right. I ain't, man, you can't pay me nothing to go on, go yeah, to, just be separated from my kids, man. Uh, when I went in, my daughter was like six months. My son was like five years. I had six years, so I missed a lot of that, man. Yeah. That's something you definitely never get back. All right, just a couple more, man. Uh, what was the first thing you wanted to eat when you got out of prison, and did you? I wanted a stuffed crust meat lover's pizza. And you got it? And I got it. Hell got a pizza. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is there anything you miss about prison? Man, it's crazy that, you know what, man? I never want to go back to prison, right? Mm-hmm. But I do miss some of the dudes, man, that I was around because they were like my brothers, bro. They were my, these were my, my friends, man. These are dudes I met in prison that were my friends. So. You know. That was my exact answer last night, man. It was a dude, Paul Chartier from New York, did 10 years for a bank robbery, got out for six months, come back in with another 20. We cleaned the floors and everything together. Orderlies watched TV, went to chow every day for two or three years. He went home, I cried. Yeah. Literally broke my fucking heart because I didn't have that dude there beside me no more. So I'm with that. I understand that completely. Yeah. Uh, what was the worst thing you saw in prison? Jesus Christ, that's probably a, if you could number I mean, I've them seen, and say the worst one. I, I've seen a dude get murdered before, but that wasn't the worst thing. And I, I think I said this before on other podcasts. We had this kid that was a bulldog, right? And he was he came to he came to Lee County. The Nortenos were like, "Yo, bro, you can't have no knife. You're gonna live in our cell." And eventually, man, they they go out on the yard and they stab the dude. The dude's kind of like bucking them, like, "Man, you guys ain't gonna tell me what to do." They stabbed him in the face, man. They stabbed him all over. And I'm out there walking around the yard. I'm going through something at the time with family situation. Um, This is when me and my wife, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. The girl I'm married to again. Mm-hmm. Um, Dude, I had a 40-year sentence. She had to go on yeah, with life. Yeah, you're supposed to let her go, yeah. So I had found something out that day, man, and it crushed me, bro. And I, I went out. I didn't go to chow. And I'm just kind of like with my head down. And I look up and I see this kid. He's like, yo, man, help me. 
And I'm like, damn, bro. And I, this dude lives in the cell next to me. I can't help him. And I talk to him every day. And I tell him, bro, I can't help you, man. Just go to the shack, man. Get the medical. And I'm like, this dude's going to die, bro. He lived. They stabbed him in the eye, stabbed him all in the face, back. It was pretty, uh, it was pretty wicked, man. Yeah, it's shit you don't forget, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, reasons to never go to prison, number 101, man. Shit like that. Best thing you ate in prison. Oh, man, I ate, man. Dude, I ate a lot of street food in prison at, at some points in my okay. life, like in Raybrook. Um, I had, dude, I had a dude that worked in the staff kitchen, bro, and they'd buy street food, and he'd bring back, you know, Pizza Hut. Nice. And I'd, dude, I'd buy it. Like I told you, dude, that was my one escape from prison was, you know, having nice shit, eating nice food, stuff like that. Yeah, so. doing what most couldn't. What about that dog, man? Yeah, right? You want me to get rid of him? I think it's my dog. <laughs> you, you're going to have to cut we that part out. It might not even be in there, bro, because I got the gain turned down pretty good. Because I try to keep the raindrops when it's raining. But yeah, yeah, I don't care. We're in the fucking camper, right? It ain't like we're in a big old studio. We're going to hear some noises. We're going to hear some cars going by and shit. Okay, uh, what was your worst day in prison? My worst day in prison? <laughs> I should probably, dude, listen, I always say it's real and it's raw, right? So I'm going to give it to you, man. My worst day in prison was that day when that kid got stabbed. My wife had to go on with her life, right? We were married. She went on with her life. We got a divorce. And I had found out, you know, this was the love of my life, bro. And I thought we'd have a son together and we were going to have a good life together, you know? But I couldn't get out of the drug game. And that day I found out that she had a son, bro. Hmm. Crush me, man. That was my worst day in prison. Hmm. And the craziest thing is that, dude, never in my life did I ever think I'd be with a chick with kids, right? Never. Never. Never thought that me and her would ever, well, it wasn't even in my mind. I, I would never, ever be with this girl, I thought. And then I get out of prison, and she contacts me. We reconnect. We get remarried. We have two little twin boys. and But that was my worst day, bro. And I never, ever thought I'd ever be with her again, but she was the love of my life, man. And I love her with all my heart. So that's a blessing, bro. And I'll say this, that uh, my worst day was when I found out that my baby's mother had died. So both mm -hmm. of my kids, mom died. I was at the USP Lee. They called me to the captain's office at 9 o'clock at night or some shit and tell me that she's dead. So, like, I wish she was here for me to come back and talk to her. Yeah. I wish her death didn't affect my kids the way it did. Yeah. So, yeah, man. I couldn't believe when you said that you had hooked back up with her. I think that's awesome. Like y'all were meant to be together, right? Yeah. I mean, and now you like, like that son, that kid is boy or girls with you now, right? Yeah. He's in college now. We got a really good relationship. I'm not his dad. He's close with his dad. He's uh -huh. a good kid, man. And I, I'm shocked that we were able to get along the way that we were. I never in my wildest dreams thought I would ever be in this situation, man. But here we are. I love her. I care about her. You know what I mean? Right. She you love him too. 100 percent right fuck yeah he, he's a good he's a good kid man he's a real good kid so yeah okay. my uh my girl's got kids her oldest one's like 22 you know i remember the day she got her training bra was how long i've been around yeah and it's like now she's grown and living and love her to death she can call me and ask me for anything if i got it it's hers man so i, I feel that uh let's see i don't know if we talked about that or not but bet, you know how did it feel when you came home like you go in for 40 fucking years, bro, and you come home and you're still young enough to actually do something. How's that feel? This is the crazy part, right? <clears throat> the judge grants my compassionate release. On the morning I'm going home, they call me to R&D. They're like, hey, you got clothes? I'm like, no, my family's got clothes. They're here to get me and whatever. If I would have had clothes, they would have released me first. I'm probably the fourth or fifth guy that's going to get released. I'm starting to walk out. I got on a sweatsuit, jail sweatsuit, whatever. They call and they say, stop them. There's an appeal. They just appealed my case that night, man. No way. They wouldn't let me out, dude. I went back in for another three weeks. Why? They appealed it. Um, and I, my lawyer was, the lawyer that I had was uh, John Gleason. He was the dude that prosecuted John Gotti. Okay. Became a federal judge for 20-something years. And they took on my case after I filed my pro se motion. They took it on pro bono, man. Didn't charge me a nickel. And they ended up, you know, petitioning the appeals court in response to that appeal my judge wrote a thing that said he couldn't believe that the government would do something like this on the eve of my release. The judge was pissed. And uh, I ended up getting out. Now I'm out, and they're talking about, hey, man, this is going to go all the way to the Supreme Court. And my lawyers are telling me, look, we may very well lose this argument. And if we do, you're going to have to go back to prison. 
So I'm out and I'm thinking, damn, I can't really get a car because I can't have a car payment because if I, I, I might go back to jail and I'm going to stick whoever. I can't really do much because, you know, as far as relationships go, I, can't, I don't want to have a kid right now or so much something like uncertainty, that. right? <clears throat> yeah, because I have this appeal that's pending and they're trying to put me back in prison. And eventually, <clears throat> eventually, um, they end up they end up losing a case to in U.S. versus Booker, who I'm really really good friends with that kid, and helped him out a, a little bit too. And then once they lost that in the Second Circuit, they dropped my appeal. So that's the day that I really felt like, oh my God, man, I'm I'm okay now. Now I can have a life. And even you know, me and Jen ended up reconnecting, and I'm telling her like, <laughs> we can't really like have kids or anything because I, I could go back to jail and. Mm-hmm. You know the the move that you're making right now. Maybe you shouldn't do this because I'm, you know, I'm I'm subject. I don't like to hurt people, man. Right. I don't want to destroy her life again, again, and leave. You know what I mean? Right. Um. And in the beginning, I pushed her away, man. Like you just got to go home and just forget about me and just go on with your life, you know. And then once that appeal thing happened, it was like, whew. right now we can commit. Yeah, but I was still on federal parole. I had a really tough probation. Well, probation, federal probation. I had a real tough probation officer call me on a Sunday. Where are you? I'm at Walmart. Don't leave. I'm on my way there. I'm like, what the? To Walmart? Yeah. Came calls down. you on the cell phone. I'm coming to Walmart to meet you. Yep. Don't Who leave. Who the fuck does that? So what do you think I'm thinking in that moment? I'm going, going to, to jail. jail. On a Sunday, you're making Absolutely. me wait at Walmart? I'm going to jail. I'm contemplating whether or not to take to on. Run. I start thinking, what did I do wrong? And I'm like, damn, I haven't done nothing wrong. Or did I? Or you know, did, did something else happen with the appeal? <clears throat> so I went through that shit for a while. Um. And then I filed a motion to get off early probation. My judge calls me to his chambers. He says, I want you and your wife and your kids to come. And he wanted to meet my kids. We go to his chambers, and he has a talk with me. He says, I'm not letting you off yet. I'm like, damn, bro. You're not letting me off? He said, you give me another year, and then we'll talk about it. You file again in another year. The judge had me in his chambers to talk to me, dude. When does that happen? Not right. And he wanted to meet my kids, and he knew my whole history with my wife. Mm-hmm. And I'm blessed, man. Judge Larimer, Rochester, New York. I'm blessed, man. Right. Well, he actually took an interest, though, right? Most judges don't do that. Yeah. And then he, uh, a year later, he lets me off, man. So I'm off. But you know what the crazy thing is, Jamie? When he let me off, I felt like you would think that you're happy and you're, these people have been a part of my life for 20-something years, bro. Back and forth, court hearings, mm-hmm. you know, fighting, you know, 2255, I win a hearing. And then I, he gives me a decision where I lose and I still got 40 years. I lose my appeal. You know, I do the compassionate release. They they have two hearings where they bring SIS to come testify against me. He was in a gang, his tattoos, and, you know, he 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 assaulted these people in prison. And, you know, they're painting this picture, man. And the judge was like, look, all this stuff was 10 years ago. You know, he's he hasn't had a shot in 10 years. The dude turned his life around. You guys are fa- – he actually wrote that they were fabricating evidence to keep me in prison. So when they finally do let me off parole, man, there was a part of me that was sad. Like, damn, I'm not going to – see the judge ever again you know this dude's been a part of my life i'm not gonna weird right and then i had a new probation officer that was like he's a good dude man he's a christian dude he was a good dude man and and when i got off it seemed like he was sad too and he's like hey man Mm -hmm. you know reach out every once in a while let me know how you're doing and i've done that hey man i'm doing all right reached out to him hey man i'm you know we're closing out a house and we're gonna do some re-entry stuff it's coming up so you know i just felt like uh, like a weight was lifted but also sad at the same time and it's crazy, man, like being involved in that shit for 20-something years in prison and parole and probation, it's like mentally, man, it, it does something to you mentally where you feel like you needed that supervision. You yeah, needed yeah, someone to look right. look over you, and now they're gone. Now you're on your own. Now you're really on your own. Now you're finally free. And do you really want to be free? Yeah, you in your heart you do, mm-hmm. but you feel like, damn, man. Well, you spend 20 years of your identity being around that, right? Like 100%. That becomes your identity. This is me. This is what I do every day. This is who I am. And I never, now all that's gone, who the fuck am I? The only time that throughout this whole thing that I ever felt like that was the probation. And when I left Raybrook, man, I was in Raybrook for like five years, left all my buddies. Eventually I would get out nine months later, but I left everybody at Raybrook and I was like, and I'm from here, man. That's where I'm from. So when I finally made it back to New York, those cops up there, dude, for real, man, they treated you all right. They didn't treat you like shit, dude. Mm-hmm. Them cops treated you right, and we're from here. I mean, I had a co- – dude, I, I, I've had a few incidents where, where I over, – over my sunglasses. And I had I did tell the cop. I said, bro, I got 40 years, man. 
I got nothing to lose, man. Mm-hmm. And you're fucking with me about a pair of sunglasses. That, these sunglasses mean something to me, man. I said, I got nothing to lose. He knew what I meant. And I ended up keeping my sunglasses, man. But you just go out, you know, some people go out of their way to fuck with you. But for the most part, those cops up there, they treated people with respect, man. If you were hungry, they let you get extra food, you know? If they had it, come on up, man, get this shit. We're going to throw it away anyway. Right. They treated people good, man. They ran a prison the old school way. The way that you, the way that when you ran it that way, people, you know, weren't out stabbing each other. Mm-hmm. You know, you treated men respect men, and, and they were they were like that there. So when I did leave, I had been there so long. I taught programs there. That's when I turned my life around. You know, there was a cop on on that compound that everyone thought was an asshole. He reminded me of one of my uncles. He came in, man. He was working the patrol, and he came in. He said, hey, "Man, I just want to tell you, man. I hope you get out of prison, man. I think you turned your life around." That meant something to me, man. It did. It meant something to me, bro. For a cop to say that to me, it meant something to me. I had Miss Rodriguez when I came home from the feds in a halfway house, and she said, when I first looked at your paperwork, I never thought you'd make it through this program. She's like, I'm so surprised to be sending you home on home monitoring today because you're the last person I thought, based on your paperwork, that you would do that. And when she said that, that still stands out to me, too, because it's like, okay, cool. That's acknowledgement (laughs) of, you know, you've done something different, man. Yeah. For sure. All right, let's see. Uh, it's getting a little cold in this chair. It is, man. We're about to wrap it up. I don't think I really have much on here. Um, I was going to say what gave you hope for the future while you're in prison, but getting home, right? Going home. I mean, it's, hope for the future is you're thinking like, if you lose hope, then then you're hit, right? But in my mind, I'm like, there were days where I thought I was never getting out, and there were other days where I was like, man, I'm getting out of here. And I worked hard to get out of prison, bro. I, I wrote people every day, senators, congressmen, clemency petitions, motions. I'm like, hey, look what, look at this program I did. I wrote my judge. I, I mean, right. Well, you participated in your release. Like yeah, if you 100%. wouldn't have participated in that, no one else was going to do it, right? Definitely not. Bro. So what felt worse? If you had to compare the two things, you're standing in court and they send you, bust you in the head with 40 years, or your first day walking into the penitentiary? The day they sentenced me, man. Walking into the penitentiary was scared. My first prison was Big Sandy. It was scary. You knew where you were going. Mm-hmm. You're like, damn, bro, I heard a lot of stories about this place. And you put that face on, that mask, like, yo, it's whatever. And I had 40 years, bro, and there was a point in my life where I'm like, man, it's whatever, bro. Like, live or die, it's whatever. I didn't have the balls to take myself out, and I used to think, well, you know what? Maybe somebody else will do it. Maybe someone else does it, and I don't have to suffer. But getting sentenced was the word. My mother was crying, bro. It felt like you're like, Wow. How you your first reaction is like, how am I gonna do this? How can I do forty years, man? And you start thinking about how old you're gonna be. And you haven't even lived forty years. Man, I was twenty four years old you don't when even I was know arrested. what forty years is. It's crazy, man. Scary shit. One hundred percent. So yeah, man, it's wrapping up. Let's wrap it up. Like, I mean, uh, obviously let's drop your YouTube page. Any other links you wanna drop? Yeah, so you know, um let me say this too. Like I mentioned it briefly. I got a guy, man, Ben. I don't know if I should say his last name on here, but man, Ben stepped up. He's like, bro, let's put that halfway house. Oh yes. I'm sorry. My bad. We got a re-entry house. We're going to try to help, you know, dudes and men and women. We got a three, three apartments inside this, this building that we're buying. Hopefully we'll be able to put some women downstairs, put the men upstairs, help people that are getting out of prison. Housing's a big thing, dude. If you got nowhere to go, what are you going to do? You're going to fall back into the same trap. I got to get some money. I need a place to stay. It's Mm -hmm. cold out here. So we're going to help people with that clothing, you know, getting people back involved in the community. And try to push dudes, man. And be right. like, you know, this and women. Like, this is it, man. You know, life has a lot to offer. Don't squander it, man. Um, so we're we're gonna be doing that. I think we're gonna call it stepping stones. Okay. I think my and my wife, she came up she with that. She came so, up with that yeah. one. That's it's called stepping stones. Um there's still a lot of logistics to talk right. about, but we're so putting you that literally together. just nailed everything down. So we rode by the house early, so it's yeah. like four thousand square feet. Yeah, forty three hundred. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Um, so we're putting that together. You know, some people know me, Blood on the Razor Wire TV. We might have to take that blood word out of there. Mm-hmm. The people said that might yeah, be hurting us. Yeah, he's talking about just an ac- acronym and Yeah. Right? Um, but anyway, man, Blood on the Razor Wire TV. Check us out on YouTube. My book is Blood on the Razor Wire. You can read the first three chapters for free on Amazon. Go check them out. You won't be disappointed. And, dude, I appreciate you. I can't believe that you're <laughs> – dude, you deserve to for things to work out for you. You got a studio inside a trailer, and you're driving all over the country, and it's not cheap. It's expensive. and it's 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 hard, but you know what? Nice. This is what if this is what you like doing. You got to make it happen, right? Yeah, I dig it. So definitely I appreciate you meeting, meeting cool cats like you, and and like a little bit of the New York culture today with the food, 
You know what I mean? Being able to ride through your city and see some of the shit that goes on there. That's stuff I don't see every day. So I enjoy that part of it too, you know? I mean, we're driving. There's a chick on the main drag pulling her pants down to piss on the sidewalk. Like, Literally on Main Street. It's 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 unbelievable, yeah, bro. It definitely is. And, and helping to change other people's lives, man. I've seen too many people die. I've seen too many people go to prison. You know, like you said, what, dude made 200 bucks and got 20 years. It's like, I, if this can do anything to help people from, from having to go through that, because I was the guy that had to touch it, bro. I don't care how hot you told me it was. And it, the flames coming off and put my hand in it. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I want somebody to be able to learn from our mistakes, man. If we can help people do that, then that's what it's all about. Well, definitely appreciate you, bro. Thanks yeah, for having man. me. Thanks Absolutely. for driving up here. Yeah, so now I just need to get this motel for me, so I got a place to go take a shower. I got you. We'll make it happen. Ain't it, man? So, look, man, Chad kept it real, man. He told us some shit he ain't never told nobody else, man. So, you know, drop a like. Hit the comments. Uh, I know some of y'all came over here from the first time I did an interview on his channel. Matter of fact, I had a dude hit me up today when I put a story on my Facebook. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there's there's a couple cats over here already, man. That's what's up. But, yeah, we definitely need some support, support for this channel, dude. And I appreciate you coming, uh, you know what I mean, making time for me because I know you had other shit to do. I'm sure you could have found some other things to do. It's Friday night, bro, but I'm here with you. I'd be anywhere I, in the world, but I'm here with you. That's it, man. And that's I'm spanking monkey. That's, that's right. That's right. All right, man. All right, Fucking bro. A.